let's take a look at buoyancy, elastic force, and drag forces. We're going to start out with buoyancy. Buoyancy is an upward force on an object when it is placed on or in a fluid. And when I say fluid, I mean gases and liquids. It's usually represented with FB, and sometimes you will hear it called up thrust, which kind of makes sense because it's an upward force, up thrust. Uh, now, buoyancy arises from fluid pressure, uh, but we're not going to get too far into the real origins of buoyancy. Um, but it has to do something with gravitational force. You can kind of see that because it's always opposing the gravitational force. It's always upward. But what we can say about buoyancy is that a fluid with more density provides more buoyancy force. Okay, and I'm going to draw a little picture here. So imagine that we have an ice cube in water. Okay, so here's water, here's air, here's the ice cube. The buoyancy force on the ice cube is in that direction. So you can see it opposes the gravitational force. It's opposite the gravitational force. Um, we can write down an equation for the buoyancy force. Here it is. Fb is equal to rho vg. Rho here is the density of the fluid. V is the volume of the fluid that has been displaced. And g is just our regular old friend acceleration due to gravity. So I want to point out, V is the volume of the fluid displaced. It's not necessarily the volume of the object that's floating. It's the volume of the fluid which has been displaced. So let's say we have a cube and each side is six centimeters. And that cube has a mass of five grams. And the question is, how far will it submerge when it is in water? Well, let's see. Um, I'm going to draw a little picture right here. Uh, and the density of water, by the way, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's useful information to know. Um, the volume of the cube that is submerged would be 6 centimeters times 6 centimeters times d. I'm going to call d the depth that the cube has sunk to. So d is right here in the diagram. Well, um, Let's figure that out. Let's see. Well, if we write this down, the gravitational force is downward and the buoyancy force is upward. And if this thing is submerged and floating, those two forces will be balanced, so we can set them equal. Okay, well, here's the mass times g, and that has to equal the buoyancy force, rho v g. Rho, we know. V, we can write down because it's 6 centimeters times 6 centimeters times the depth, depth to which it's submerged. And then g is just the gravitational acceleration. So if we solve for that, the depth to which it has sunk is 0 0.0136 meters, or 1.36 centimeters. And now let's take a look at elastic force. So an elastic force is a force which acts to return an object to its original shape. So for example, let's say that we had a meter stick suspended between two tables like this and then we place something on the meter stick big bag of money maybe uh, that would bend the meter stick and the elastic force is the force that would push back on that bag of money it's a force that's acting to return the object to its original shape another example is if we have a spring uh, and then we hang an object from the spring the spring would stretch and the elastic force would, on that object that's hanging from the spring would be upward. It's a force that, again, acts to return the object to its original shape. Now, if an object is deformed too much, if we push it too far from its original shape, it can pass its elastic limit. Uh, when that happens, then it won't return to its original shape, and it'll be forever changed. Uh, it'll be broken or bent or stretched in some way. So for example, if you had a spring and you put a very heavy object on it, the spring would stretch a lot. And then when you take the object off, if it's past its elastic limit, then when it tries to return to its original shape, it turns out the spring is bent and it no longer can return to its original shape. Okay. Uh, now for many objects, like for example, a lot of springs, the magnitude of the elastic force is proportional to its displacement from equilibrium, 
and in the opposite direction of its displacement from equilibrium. So for example, if we have a spring and we stretch it, there'll be an elastic force trying to bring it back towards equilibrium, its original shape. But if we stretch it even more, the elastic force is even greater. In situations like this, we say that the object obeys Hooke's law, or the elastic force obeys Hooke's law. And the expression would be like this. Uh, Fh, where h is Hooke, uh, is equal to negative kx. Now the negative is there because the force is in the opposite direction of its displacement from equilibrium. x here represents its displacement from equilibrium, and k is a constant. It's called the spring constant, and it's different for any object. Um, one spring would have one spring constant, a different spring would have another spring constant, and that spring constant has units of newtons per meter. And last we're going to look at drag force. So the drag force is the force of resistance to relative motion through a fluid. So for example, if we had a ball that was thrown through the air traveling in this direction, the drag force is the resistance to that motion through the air. It would be in the opposite direction. Or if we had a marble that was falling through water, um, if the marble is falling downward, then the drag force would be upward. It opposes the motion through the fluid. Now the exact like numerical description of drag is quite complicated. It's caused by the influence of atoms and molecules in a fluid as they move over or near a surface. Um, but what we can say uh, is that for small objects the drag force is proportional to the speed of the object through the fluid. And for big objects, the drag force is proportional to the speed squared. Uh, now, if we want to be a little more numerical about this, we can also define something called the viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the fluid's resistance to movement through it. Uh, and it's represented with the Greek letter eta. looks like this. It's like an N with like kind of a curly foot. Um, and viscosity has units of kilograms per meter per second. Uh, now, if there is only a little turbulence, if there's a small amount of turbulence or no turbulence, then the influence of viscosity is the biggest influence as the object travels through the fluid. Uh, so what we can write down is this expression. If we have a sphere of radius r, then the drag force will be equal to 6 pi times the viscosity times r times v, where R, again, is the radius of this sphere that's traveling through the fluid. Eta, there, is the viscosity. And V is the speed of the object as it travels through the fluid. Um, now, this might seem like a very specialized case, and it is a very specialized case. This only applies to spheres traveling through a fluid when there's very little turbulence. Uh, but it turns out it can be pretty useful. Um, for example, if we had an object that's traveling through a fluid at its terminal velocity, and when I say terminal velocity, what I mean is that's when the gravitational force is balanced by the drag force, um, well, then we would be able to set up an expression. We'd be able to say that the drag force is equal or balanced by the gravitational force, and then this 6 pi viscosity RV would be equal to mg in that situation.